much. Hi. Pleasure to be here. And thank you so much, um, uh, Teresa, for giving me the opportunity to speak. I'm going to show some slides so you don't have to look at my face the whole time. <laughs> that will be good. Um, I want to uh, focus on, and uh, Roger is going to be changing my slides. Well done, yeah. Uh, so I, I would like to focus on the importance of defending secularism, universalism, free expression, and citizenship rights when we are confronting Islamism. To begin with, I'd like to clarify some of the distinctions between Islam, which is of course an idea, Muslims who are people, mm. how surprising, and Islamism, which is obviously the religious far right. It's a political movement. Now, the problem is that very often these three are conflated together, and that is usually uh, advantageous to the Islamists, and a disadvantage to everybody else. Let me explain. Um, Islamism is a political movement with state power. So whilst it relies on religion and uses violence and terror, it's firmly rooted in uh, political equations for the extreme right-wing restructuring of society. It might be easier when you make a comparison, as Paul did as well, with other religious right movements, whether it's the Hindu right, um, uh, for example, responsible for a massacre of Muslims in Gujarat, or the Christian right, the Jewish right, uh, attacks on uh, Palestinian territories via the settlers, or the Buddhist right, which, you know, everybody talks about how wonderful Buddhism is, but they have been uh, also spearheading the murder of Muslims in places like Sri Lanka and Myanmar. Um, and I think they're, they're fundamentally similar uh, with Islamism. Fundamentally, though, obviously, there are great differences as well as there is in any phenomenon, and also depending on the amount of power and influence that they have. The fight for secularism and universal values is first and foremost a fight against this religious right wing in general and I think obviously Islamism in particular, whether it's Europe or globally. Islam on the other hand is a religion, it's an idea and like all other ideas can and must be open to criticism, even mockery and even blasphemy. When you can be killed for leaving Islam, for criticizing Islam, for questioning it, then the celebration and normalization of blasphemy and apostasy are very, very important forms of resistance. As uh, Walid al Husseini will know, he's, uh, he was uh, an atheist in the Palestine, he is an atheist, but he was arrested for a year in the Palestinian ter territories for um, his atheism, and he's just done a book on called blasphemy. Now, obviously, as, as the example of Walid shows, these are, it's increasingly difficult, not just though in countries where Islamic rules are in place, where Islamists are in power, but also here in Europe. Uh, it's, it's, it's very becoming increasingly difficult to provide a much needed criticism of Islam and Islamism. And I think one of the reasons is because this criticism is often equated with bigotry against the Muslim minority. And there are accusations of Islamophobia, which we have all heard, which in my opinion are often used to silence people, scaremonger people into silence, rather than out of any patronizing concern for Muslims and minorities, as if minorities do not also have the right to question and criticize religion and become atheists. Uh, it's not just for white people, you know, the right to leave, it, leave religion and to criticize it. Um, and I think one of the problems is this homogenization of entire communities and entire societies. You know, we hear about the Muslim community, the Islamic world, uh, as if there are no differences of opinion in those societies and communities. Um, and obviously that's not the case. There are people who oppose and dislike and disagree with Islamic tenets, even Muslims, not just atheists, even Muslims. 
uh, just as there are Christians in Europe who are atheists, who might be Christians but criticize, you know, the Catholic Church, and they might criticize the Christian right. It's, it's very similar. Equating criticism of Islam with bigotry only helps the Islamists in their imposition of what are sort of secular blasphemy laws because they use rights language to censor and limit uh, the right to free expression, the right to criticize religion and Islam. And I think it's very clear that freedom of expression, as was mentioned earlier as well by Paul, without the right to criticize religion is meaningless. It makes no sense. This criticism has been uh, necessary for social progress for, for many centuries. Historically, it's been linked with anti-clericalism. And, uh, and obviously, in the age of ISIS, criticism of religion is key for the defense of rights and for equality. It also helps to dismantle and subvert the sacred and its political role and open the space for dissent where none is permissible or acceptable by those in power. Now, the problem is when masses of people are homogenized and seen to be one and the same with Islamists, the right to free expression is reduced to a Western right rather than a universal one. But no one, no one needs free expression more than those who are living under or struggling against <laughs> the religious right, where criticism of religion is often seen to be analogous with criticism of the state and it has serious consequences. This gives added importance to the free expression as of those of us who live in Europe. Our criticism can help to push open the space for dissent, particularly for those who are unable to do so or who are paying for their criticism with their very lives. Uh, one more slide, please. Now, the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain, which is an organization I founded, is an exa excellent example of this. When we started nearly nine years ago to break the taboo that comes with leaving Islam and to challenge apostasy laws, there were hardly any ex-Muslims willing to speak publicly. Today, there are many uh, coming out of the closet, asserting their right to atheism, including in countries where it's a prosecutable offense, primarily via social media. So there was a hashtag we started in December 2012 called ex-Muslim because. So here's one where she says ex-Muslim because I'm a woman. Uh, there's another one which says ex-Muslim because of bacon, yum. Um, and you know, uh, and one final one, let's just show the, uh, yes, this one, ex-Muslim because there's no 72 virgins for me. And, and obviously, um, you know, this, what, what was interesting for us is when we started it, we thought that we wouldn't have as many people joining in this hashtag, but in 24 hours it became viral, 100,000 tweets on this, uh, with this hashtag from 65 different countries. And there were some that were funny, uh, and some that were heartbreaking, and, and many who felt that, you know, who said that they just sat there and cried uh, at their computer screens because they felt uh, for, for once that they were not crazy and that they were not alone. And I think um, it shows uh, that um, how much of a movement the demand for free thought and atheism is amongst those who are considered Muslim. And of course, this is despite the fact that, you know, atheism is a serious challenge to the Islamist movement. Saudi Arabia, for example, a good friend of the EU and uh, the US government, uh, introduced a law in 2014 which defined atheism as terrorism. And of course, we know that there are 14 states in which atheists are given the death penalty, Afghanistan, Iran, the Islamic State, Malaysia, Maldives, Mauritania, Nigeria, Pakistan, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, Sudan, the UAE, and Yemen. And even in Europe, though, 
many ex-Muslims remain in the closet. Uh, they fear uh, of upsetting their families and facing isolation, being ostracized, and also, of course, placing themselves in danger. Ex-Muslims are often seen through the eyes of our fascists, the Islamists. That's how we are perceived very often. Uh, you, with labels of Islamophobia, uh, we are called native informants, coconuts, which means we're brown on the outside, white inside, because we dare to think freely. Uh, or we are accused of inciting hatred against um, Muslims, when in fact uh, the hatred is being incited against us by Islamists. Uh, and uh, we have many allies amongst those who are considered Muslims as well. There's, uh, here's a lecture at one university which says, we are the new McCarthyites, we are the ex-Muslims and other native informants. Nonetheless, what's very clear, I think Paul mentioned this as well, is the fact that the right to religion has a corresponding right, which is equally, if not more important, to be free from religion. And that includes for people who are labeled Muslims. And though dissent is often portrayed, very often as a betrayal of the Muslim community, um, it's very much part and parcel of everyday life. I, I remember being at a protest against the stoning of a woman in Iran. And an Iranian woman came up to me, uh, not wearing the hijab, obviously, um, you know, dressed uh, um, without any concern about being a Muslim. But she came and told me, how dare you embarrass uh, Iran? in front of uh, the, the, the world. And I told her, for me, the woman who's being stoned is my country. Uh, you know, I'm not concerned about uh, the Iranian government's perspective on things or the Islamist perspective on things. I, I'm concerned with the victims, the, resi the, the resistors, and those who dissent. So what I want to say, though, is that this dissent is very much alive and well. Everything even though in Europe it's as if you know every Muslim loves the veil, loves Sharia law, loves Islamism. Um, this, these are all issues, gender segregation, that are highly contested. Um, and they're challenged day in and day out. But because of this homogenization of Muslims and the fact that Muslims are equated with Islamists, there is this absurd perception that there is no dissent. It's as if we don't have atheists, secularists, socialists, feminists, liberals, democrats. We're all Muslims, and the worst type of Muslim, which is the default Muslim, is you know, the authentic Muslim. And there's a great cartoon here, if Roger wants to show it, where the man looks at the shower curtain and says, you look gorgeous today, dear. And the woman is saying, I'm here. <laughs> and that, that is exactly the sort of default authentic Muslim perceived in the media, very often by the government and, and, and many others. And I think partly this has a lot to do with identity politics and multiculturalism. Multiculturalism is a wonderful lived experience. But as a social policy, it's segregationist. It divides and segregates people into homogenized communities. And we see this internationally as well with the neoconservative agenda to Iraqize the world. Everything, you know, is separa separated. Sunnis, Shias. There's no more citizens, no more human beings. And in, in a sense, because of this, uh, Muslims have been essentialized. They've been otherized. So that solidarity uh, against bigotry or against violations of rights for Muslims is always ends up being solidarity with the Islamists rather than with the dissenters and the free thinkers and the secularists. So this is a perfect example. I spoke at Goldsmiths University in London a few months ago and the brothers of the Islamic society said that if I spoke there it would violate their safe space. And because I'm an, I'm an Islamophobe and I'm inciting hatred. And when my talk went ahead, they came into my meeting. They tried to disrupt it. Uh, this is during my talk. They started, uh, they laughed when I uh, talked about the hacking to death of Bangladeshi bloggers. They uh, uh, tried to uh, turn off my PowerPoint. Uh, 
to one of my colleagues, they made a gun sign when he was talking. Uh, they passed by one other person and they made a boom sound. Uh, you know, attempts to intimidate and to cancel my meeting. I, I, w I didn't allow it to be canceled. And eventually we managed to um, kick him out. He's actually the president of the Islamic Society. But the reason I'm telling you this is because after all this happened, the Feminist Society of Goldsmiths and the uh, LGBTQ plus Society of Goldsmith issued a statement of solidarity with the Islamic Society against me. And they apologized to him and his brothers, where the sisters had to sit in the back of the room, apologized to him that he had to listen to someone like myself saying that, while people have the right to religion, we also have the right to leave religion. Uh, and this is how absurd identity politics is. Solidarity with the authentic Muslim against those who are actually fighting for women's rights and for gay rights and so on and so forth. What was really funny is that he was eventually had to leave his position because after attention was brought onto him, they found tons of homophobic tweets that he had done. And yet, of course, the, the statement of solidarity by the Lesbian and Gay Society is still standing, and it's for him. Uh, Mariama Hela Lucas, which is a, um, who is a wonderful, 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 I can't say enough wonderful, Algerian sociologist who started Women Living Under Muslim Laws, who is now head of secularism is a women's issue. She says that what is most upsetting in all of this is the implication that oppressed people can only turn out as fascists, never revolutionaries. Is this really what the left in Europe believes? She adds, can the left accept that citizens are assigned a minority identity against their will on the basis of their name, their geographical origin, or that of their families? Can the left accept that this communal identity supersedes civil rights? This, is, this was done to Jews under Nazism. Will the left accept that it be done to Muslims and those presumed to be Muslims, regardless of their personal beliefs? If the left is serious about supporting oppressed minorities, it should realize that those who speak in the name of the community do not necessarily have the legitimacy to do so. By supporting fundamentalists, they simply choose one camp in a political struggle without acknowledging it. And I think this is exactly what is happening. This has always also been the position of, uh, let's say, successive British governments. Next slide, please, Roger. Whereby multiculturalism and multi-faithism has been promoted as social policies to defend religion's role in the public space, impose religious identity as the only marker that defines countless citizens and hand over large sections of citizens, they are citizens, to be managed and controlled by regressive Islamic organizations and imams. There are no more citizens in Britain, in Europe, in many places across the world but segregated communities with their own faith schools, their own faith-based services, and even their own faith-based courts, separate and unequal. Next slide, please. But you, you, cannot, you cannot be a 21st century human being and live under Islamic rules, whether it's in Europe or anywhere else, and not clash with it. It's impossible. You don't need to draw a cartoon of Muhammad, Islam's prophet, to do this. Let's just take Valentine's Day. Here's a picture of people celebrating Valentine's Day in Iran. Just celebrate that and see what happens. From Indonesia to Pakistan to Iran, there were fatwas and edicts stopping people, telling people that they had to stop celebrating Valentine's Day. Last year in Saudi Arabia, five men were arrested Listen to this title, by the Commission for the Promotion of Virtue and the Prevention of Vice. These are actual police in certain countries. Uh, and they were sentenced to 32 years in prison and 4,500 lashes because they had a Valentine's Day party. And they were dancing with unrelated women, drinking, 
and socializing. In Islamic schools right here in Britain, children, our children, our citizens, are not allowed to celebrate their own birthdays because it's haram, let alone Valentine's Day. It is considered un-Islamic. Take anything else, take music. We're not talking about drawing the Prophet Muhammad. Take music. ISIS recently beheaded a 15-year-old boy because he was listening to Western music on his CD music player in his father's shop. All these far-right people that publicize this information and then vilify 15-year-olds and young men who are fleeing Syria and ISIS and the Assad regime. In Iran, you've got a band called Confess. They are a heavy metal band. They have been charged with the death penalty and blasphemy in Iran just a few weeks ago. Why? Because they are advertising against the system. They are forming and running an illegal band and record label in the satanic metal and rock music style. They are writing anti-religious, atheist, political, and anarchist lyrics. They have been sentenced with blasphemy. In Mali, the Songhai um, blues, I, I wish I could l play you their music. It is enough to make you go crazy how beautiful it is. But their lead singer, uh, you know, in Mali, the Islamists have banned music. And their lead singer, who you can see there, uh, Ali Oture, he says, we had no idea that one day we would be forbidden from playing music because music is universal. It's like being forbidden to see the woman you love. Music for us is like a woman we love. In Britain too, you've got the Muslim Council of Britain saying that children of Muslim parents must avoid harmful music. As I said, there's this constant clash between people's lives and Islamic rules. If there wasn't these clashes, they wouldn't need something as ridiculous as the Commission for the Promotion of Vice and the Prevention, Promotion of Virtue and the Prevention of Vice. And obviously, Islamists wouldn't need to impose their laws with such indiscriminate violence and repression. Here's a picture of a woman before that, sorry, being harassed and arrested by the morality police in Iran because her veil is not put on properly. You know, the terrorism we talk about and see in Paris and in London, they are, it's also taking place in mosques and markets and schools in many cities across the world. And it's just the tip of the iceberg of what we see. You've got Sharia law, which controls every aspect of people's lives, making clashes inevitable, particularly since a large majority of the population in the Middle East are under 30. I want to show you these. these are, this is an artwork by an artist called Mimzi, which criticizes, obviously, ISIS and how it's ISIS there are mysis. It's a children's toy, Sylvanian children's toy. The ISIS are mysis. And as you can see, they, they are, you know, there in the most normal family scenes, people having picnics. Roger, if you can show the other ones. Children going to school. The next one, please. You know, people having a drink at a cafe. And I think there's one more. Or at the beach, where, you know, in Tunisia, for example, we saw. And this was removed by the British police for being inflammatory and offensive. I mean... You know, whereas in fact the real offense is, is Islamism and, and it's terrorism. And, you know, so I gave you so many examples of how people's lives clashes. And of course, there are so many other examples, if we can go to the next slide, of people that have come into um, clashes with the state for questioning um, Islam and challenging it. You've got Raif Badawi, for example, the next slide, please, who's been charged with 10 years imprisonment and a thousand lashes. You've got the Bangladeshi bloggers. Uh, and, and it's not just atheists or secularists who are facing these. There are 27 Sudanese Muslims from the Qurani sect in Sudan who've been charged with apostasy because they consider the Quran holy, but they don't think that the Hadith, which is uh, Muhammad's sayings and actions are authentic. So they've been punished with the death penalty. Uh, what, so I want to explain to you that this is not just something that is an issue for atheists and secularists around. There's Abdul Aziz Daouda in Nigeria. He's an Islamic scholar. He's been sentenced to death for blasphemy because he gave a lecture that they said was blasphemous. 
end of story. Or you've got someone like Fatima Naoud in Egypt. Next slide, please. Um, she's just been given a three-year sentence in Egypt for insulting Islam. But why? Because she said Islamic slaughter is a massacre uh, and it's, it's unacceptable. And this list it continues on and on. And for me, what I find really hilarious in a tragic way is when groups like Pegida and the far right say that they are the only ones who are critical of Islam. They cry crocodile tears for the victims of Islamism whilst at the same time dehumanizing and vilifying the victims of Islamism, the survivors, by equating, for example, all refugees with ISIS in order to defend what I think is fundamentally a white Christian Europe also relying on identity politics uh, against what they perceive to be Muslim and migrant savage hordes. And I think they, they buy into this idea where there is this clash of civilizations between a secular um, West and a, a sort of religious East, but I, I disagree with this um, clash of civilizations. I don't know if you know of author Keenan Malik, uh, who's also done a lot of brilliant work on the issue of religion and racism as well. And he says secularism and fundamentalism are not stitched into people's DNA. Uh, th they're ideas uh, that can be changed, that can be challenged. And in a sense, when we look at this clash, it's not between the East and West, but it is between secularists in the West and East versus the theocrats in the West and East. And I think you know, in a sense, when we talk about Islam and Islamism and only focus on what happens in the West, we forget that this movement has for the past several decades maintained itself with the slaughter of an entire generation. Uh, you know, Paul talked about the fatwa against Salman Rushdie in 89, but for a period of 10 years, the Iranian regime slaughtered an entire generation in order to maintain its rule. There are mass graves in Iran with no identification. There are places called Khavaran where people are buried in mass graves. And on certain evenings, uh, 500, 600 people were executed at a time for challenging the regime. Um, I'm not sure how much more time I have. Um, uh, I, I think it's time now. Now? OK. Yeah. Um, so can I just, I, I'd like to just give you one quick example, if I can, of Afghanistan. Um, you know, just to show that when uh, Farhunde, which is a woman who um, uh, was uh, beaten and uh, murdered um, by a mob while the police stood by, um, you had discussions on social media saying that, well, you know, what does she expect? Because she was ex uh, accused of burning the Quran. What does she expect if she's going to hurt Muslim sensibilities in this way. But you know what was clear is that Farhunde herself was a Muslim, and there were many protests in her defense. This is one that happened after another killing. But you have, for example, women in Afghanistan with signs saying, we need the, um, we need the merchants of religion's hands to be cut off from people's lives. And what, became very, what becomes very clear, if you look at any of these sort of cases, you do see that there is a lot of resistance. Unless we begin to see that resistance, we will constantly end up siding with the Islamists against those who are challenging them and who are our greatest allies, including many Muslims, including many of those who are fleeing to Europe right now. Uh, and obviously, within this context, secularism and the defense of the separation of religion from the state is so key uh, because it protects people, religious and non-religious as well. And I think we need to go back to basics really, if I'm gonna end here, is that if we're gonna challenge the religious right, we've gotta challenge identity politics and multiculturalism, we've gotta challenge the Iraqization of the world, we've gotta go back to defending concepts such as citizenship rights, universal rights, and of course secularism, and to see that actually this is a fight that is global. Islamism is a global movement, and um, our fight against it is also global. Thank you. Uh -huh.